We are continuing our summer series entitled The Fruit of the Spirit, where we're trying to address some of the questions and clarify some of the confusion that surrounds the person, work, and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, today we are continuing in the sixth installment in this series, and today we will begin looking at the actual fruit of the Spirit. May I invite you to open with in your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and I'd like to read verses 28 and verse 29. I'm reading from the New King James. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We quote that a lot, never asking, well, what is the good toward which God is working all things in the lives of his children, when verse 29 gives us the clear answer. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God is working all things together in your life to mold you into the image and likeness of His Son. He's not content to wait until you die and get to heaven before you look like Jesus. He wants to work it out here and now. Would you turn over, please, in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. There are many places in which God in the New Testament describes for us what the image and likeness of Christ is. But since we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, we will draw your attention to one of those descriptions of the image and likeness of our Lord. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Thank you. You may be seated. By way of reminder, in our series on the Holy Spirit, we have suggested to you, according to the Bible, that the Holy Spirit is God. Every divine characteristic of the Father is true of the Holy Spirit. Every divine characteristic of the Son, the Lord Jesus, is true of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our loving Lord and intimate companion. Nobody knows you as well as the Holy Spirit knows you. You don't even know yourself as well as the Holy Spirit knows you. And He, knowing you thoroughly well, intimately well, loves you unconditionally. Amen. As we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, we also want to suggest that the Holy Spirit is the one who actually produces in us the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ, which you and I know as the fruit of the Spirit. This morning we'd like to begin looking at the fruit of the Spirit, but before we look at the first fruit that is mentioned, which is love, I'd like to just be sure and clarify a couple of points about the fruit of the Spirit. First of all, the fruit of the Spirit is a cluster of character qualities. Notice in Galatians 5.22, the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Does the Bible say, look on the screen please, but the fruits of the Spirit are. Is that what it says? No. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. It's singular. All right? Now, Paul will talk about the gifts of the Spirit are, but he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is. What's the difference? Well, 
besides there being a total difference between the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and they would include gifts like prophecy, pastor, teacher, evangelism, mercy, helps, healings. Those are gifts of the Holy Spirit, all right? They are plural, gifts. No one has all of the gifts. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temper, so forth. They are a cluster of character qualities. Every believer gets all of the fruit. Every believer gets one or more of the gifts. Let me uh, give you another illustration. Someone said it's, it's like when a Christian uh, is a new believer, the Holy Spirit takes you into an orchard and then into a vineyard. The orchard is called the gifts of the Spirit and the vineyard is called the fruit of the Spirit. Are you with me? So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit takes you into His orchard and there are many trees in this orchard. And on every tree there are multiple fruits and they are different from one another, slightly different from each other. It's obvious upon close observation. When the Holy Spirit takes you into the orchard, the Holy Spirit plucks at least one of these fruit and He gives you that fruit called your gift of the Spirit or your spiritual gift. And it could be mercy or helps or wisdom or teaching, as I just mentioned, one of the gifts. Many people get several of these fruit called gifts. Okay? The Holy Spirit gives you the ones that He wants to give you, give you and they're tied into His mission and purpose for your life. Once He gives you the fruit from the orchard, then He takes you into His vineyard. As you go into the vineyard, you see this very, very huge vine that just goes on and on. It's one vine that just goes on and on and on and on. And it is a very prolific producing vine. I mean, there are clusters of grapes everywhere. But upon close examination, you notice that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine grapes in every cluster. Every cluster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You could count all of the millions of clusters and all of them have nine grapes. The Holy Spirit removes one cluster and He gives you the entire cluster of nine grapes. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Every believer got at least one gift and may have several. No believer would have all of the gifts of the Spirit. But every believer receives your cluster of grapes called the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, temper, and so forth. And you receive an entire cluster. In other words, Bill Jones cannot say, well, preacher, that's true. Theron Conley got a cluster of nine. I only got a cluster of seven grapes. I didn't get patience and I didn't get love. So I guess I don't have to worry about those. I don't have to be loving and I don't have to be patient. Now, is that theologically true? No, he gets a whole cluster. Everybody, nobody can say, well, that, I'm Irish, I've had a bad temper, I've been impatient, I'll always be that way. i got eight grapes in my cluster. You cannot use that as an excuse. Those nine qualities, character qualities, are the character of Christ. Okay? And you get them all. The Holy Spirit wants to cultivate each of these nine qualities in your life and in my life. And nobody is exempt from any of the fruit of the Spirit. All right? So they're a cluster. You get them all. All right? Number two, they are supernatural qualities. The fruit of the Spirit is. Now, did Paul say the fruit of the flesh is? Right there? No, he said the fruit of the Spirit is. That's very important. He doesn't say the fruit of the Christian is, the fruit of the deacon is, the fruit of the preacher is, the fruit of the Sunday school teacher is. He says the fruit of the Spirit. These character qualities are supernatural. 
Now, let me go back to the gifts and the, uh, the fruit for just a moment. Those of you who have been with me as we've talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, talking about the prophecy, the teaching, the helps, the mercy, the wisdom, the healings, those things. We say that the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the believer reveal the Holy Spirit's presence because they're the gifts of the Spirit. They, rep they reveal His power because they're supernatural enablements to do ministry. And they also reveal His personality. It gives me three Ps. You see my alliteration. It reveals His personality. When it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, it's going to be very similar. The fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, these reveal the presence of the Holy Spirit because they're the fruit of the Spirit. They reveal the Holy Spirit's power in my life because they're not something I can produce. Well, you don't know my wife. She is the most loving person. That's one of the reasons I fell in love with her. She's the most loving person you've ever seen in your life. She's got love for everybody. She's just everybody's surrogate mom. I mean, everybody loves her because she loves everybody. Well, that's wonderful. And I admit, some people are just naturally loving people. But we're not talking about natural loving here. We're talking about a supernatural love. Like the Ever Ready Bunny that keeps on loving. Keeps on and on and on. Because it's supernatural. All right? If you can produce it in the flesh, then it's not the fruit of the Spirit. All right? Now, it also... So the fruit of the Spirit revealed the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives, His power in our lives, and also His character in our lives. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the temperance, self-control. These things reveal His character. So you see, just like the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really about the Spirit, so the fruit of the Spirit are really about the Spirit. See, we've got to get over this thing about the Christian life being about me. I'm important in this thing but I'm just a vessel. I'm a tool in the hands of God. The Christian life is not about me. Life is not about me. It is about Him who lives within me and is wanting to express Himself through me to others. All right? All right, good. Also, in John 15, 5, Jesus identifies the supernatural character of this fruit. Would you read that with me, please? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Jesus is saying, you're a branch. Branches don't have life. The vine has life. Branches don't have roots. The vine has roots. Branches don't produce a thing. They bear fruit, but they don't produce fruit. The vine produces, the branches bear. So it's a supernatural thing. So the fruit of the Spirit are supernatural. All right? Now, the first fruit of the Spirit mentioned is love. Why is that mentioned first? Do you think it could possibly have been an accident that Paul mentioned love first? No, you don't. Because you and I believe every word is breathed, authoritative, and given by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? So even the order has some significance. And the fact that love is the first one should not be quickly overlooked. We notice that love is first, and I think first of it's mentioned because love is the very nature of God. The Bible does not say love is God. That's what the old hippie types used to say when they'd smoke their pot and say Love is God, and whatever love does is what we're going to do, and you have situational ethics, and I always do the loving thing, and the loving thing generally meant I'm going to fulfill my appetites on your body or whatever. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God is love. It identifies that as His nature. His character is love. So if that is God's nature, that God is love, then surely that is one of the reasons Paul would make that the very first fruit of the cluster. First John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And by the way, this week in preparation for this, I was reading that passage where Paul says, 
uh, that we don't even comprehend the depth of the love of Christ for us. I got exciting just meditating on that. We're talking about love here, and you and I don't even have, but just scratching the surface, the kind of understanding of God's love. And that means that one day we'll understand that better. And we'll wish we understood it better down here, but we can understand something of His love. So love is God's nature. And if it's God's nature, it's very, very important for us to understand whose new nature do we have. We have His. When you and I were born again by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within us, and we experienced the new birth. What's the purpose of the new birth? To give us God's nature. So love ought to be our nature as well. Love ought to be as natural for you and me as swimming to a duck, even though we have to learn how to love and to let God do the loving through us. That is something we have to learn. But we ought to all be lovers by nature. Also, this love is agape love. When it says God is love, the word there is agape. Now, there are three types of love. You are aware of this in the New Testament. There's eros, which is passionate, physical type of love. There is phileos, which is brotherly love. And then there's agape. That's the kind of love God is. God may somehow, He may have and possess eros and philos, but agape is His nature. And what is agape love? Well, agape love, if you do a word study, see where it shows up, you'll discover that agape love is a self-sacrificing, unconditional de devotion that seeks God's highest and best good for another person. That is agape love. There's nothing really emotional about 1 Corinthians 13, which is the classic definition of agape love. Agape love doesn't even have to be affectionate. Agape love doesn't even have to like the object of its love. Uh, that set me free as a young pastor. I knew I was supposed to love every member of our congregation. And some people I loved because they were loving. And then there were other people who were just... <laughs> and I didn't like them too much. And they didn't like me too much either. But we didn't like each other. That meant I didn't like... Well, I like Brian. I love to be with Brian. I love to hobnob with Brian. I love to go out to lunch with Brian. I love to be with Brian. I like Brian. I enjoy his friendship. I didn't enjoy these people. I didn't want to be around these people. Had to be around them sometimes, but I didn't want to be around them. So I was having difficulty. Since I didn't really like them, how could I love them? But one day God showed me in the Word that love, agape love, is not about liking. You can dislike somebody. You can disagree with them vehemently and still have agape type of love for them. Now, that liberated me. It really, really did. I began to realize that agape is not a feeling. It is an act of the will that releases the Holy Spirit to do something in my life toward that person. Have you ever said, I am not going to love that person. I'm not going to forgive that person. I'm enjoying holding this grudge against that person. Come on, man. Don't look righteous at me. I'm not the only one. Chuck and I are the only ones that are willing to admit it. Okay. Well, once we say, God... He, he convicts you and he says, no, you, I, you've got to love that person. You say, well, how am I going to do it? I don't even like them. I despise that person. And he says, fine, let me. You make the commitment to be obedient to my command and then I'll give you that love. I have read testimonies of people who were hurt deeper than I can even describe in human terms by another person who were able to rise out of the ashes of their devastation and pain. And with the power of God's Spirit, love another human being with God's type of love. And they would never have been able to do that in their own power and strength. So you don't have to like your pastor, but you've got to love me. Okay? Oh, amen. Thank you. Amen. Uh, but it is a self-sacrificing type of love. We see this, for example, in 1 John 3.16. Would you join me in reading that, please? By this we know love, 
because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That is agape love. Is that not self-sacrificing love that is seeking God's highest and best will for another person? You find the same word in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, unconditional, self-sacrificing love that wanted His best for a lost and dying world. For God so loved the world that He what? He gave. He gave the best He had. He made the deepest sacrifice He could make. That's what agape love does. Unconditional, self-sacrificing love. It was unconditional because the Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God proved His love for us in that while we were rebels, we were sinners, we were disregarding God, we didn't give a flip about God. We were not seeking God. Jesus died to show us what agape love is. It's very important. And that, I believe, is in essence why Paul was led of the Spirit to put love first in the cluster of the fruit of the Spirit. It's God's nature. It's your nature as well. And we are, by nature, lovers. The fruit of the love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It is primary. In Galatians 5, 2, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is first because it's fundamental to God's character, to your character, and to the most basic commands of the New Testament. So Paul lists it first. Also, love is essential. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, if you would join me in reading that, please. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. Now, folks, let me put it to you straight. You may be able to quote the Bible backwards and forwards. You may be the most self-righteous person in this entire congregation. But if you don't have love, then you are a devastation on two legs. You are a failure as a Christian if you don't have love. Paul says, I can give my body to be burned. I can make the ultimate sacrifice. But if I don't have love, it's nothing. And I am nothing. Love is the first cluster in this fruit because it is absolutely essential. Love is motivational. It's another reason I think it's first. It's motivational. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, and the word is agape, keep my commandments. Uh, if someone's in love with Jesus, they will honor His Lordship in their lives. Now, I uh, learned pretty early as a young pastor that there were two fundamental ways of motiva- motivating God's people. One was through guilt. You can kind of guilt a lot of God's people into doing what they really ought to do. I mean, I know they ought to do it because the Bible says we ought to do it. So you just guilt them into doing it. And they feel bad if they don't do it. Now, that will get you so far but not real far in motivating God's people. The other way of motivating God's people is to help them fall more in love with Jesus and let them respond to Jesus' commands out of love. That will take you a long way. People, I learned, would make a lot more personal sacrifice if they're responding to the commands of God and the challenges of God out of love for Jesus than if I am motivating them out of a sense of legalism and guilt. And since we are living in the realm of grace, not law, I really don't think guilt is an appropriate motivation. Now, sometimes people may think that another Christian, pastor or not, is trying to use guilt to motivate us, when that may not be the case. If they're quoting the Scripture to you, if they're sharing with you the Word of God in love, and the Holy Spirit starts convicting you, don't just try to uh, push them aside by saying, oh, you're just trying to use guilt motivation. 
The Word of God will bring conviction. All right? And love for Jesus will respond. I've had people kind of get on me about some things. And my initial reaction may be one of pushback. Defend myself. Push back. And then as I get to thinking about this more and more, I begin to realize that was not the appropriate response. And I say, Lord, if there's truth in their, their statement, then, Lord, I want my heart to be open to that truth. Why should I be afraid of conviction? If it's true, then let it be true. Let the conviction roll and let's get it dealt with. But rather than pushing back in the flesh, you see. So, Lord, if there's any truth in what they're saying, then my heart is open to you. Because I love you. I, 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 I want to serve you. I want to honor your lordship in my life. So my heart is yours. You can do anything you want to do. I'm not going to let somebody be Holy Spirit to me. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit be Holy Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit wants to use them to shed some light on something, then I need to be open. That's what I'm saying. I don't need to be threatened and pushed back on them. Does that make sense at all? I hope it does. But uh, love is motivational. Love motivates me to want to obey Jesus. And I love what John says in 1 John. He says, and his commandments are not burdensome. They are not burdensome. Uh, also, in Matthew 5, would you like to read that one with me, please? Jesus is speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount. I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Be perfect in love, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. A lot of people don't understand what Jesus is saying when He says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I added the words in italics there, in love. Because I think in the context, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Your Father loves the unlovely. He loves the unrighteous. He loves even His enemies. He blesses those who curse Him. Now, if you're His child... I want you to be perfect in love as your heavenly Father is perfect in love. So in other words, if I'm in love with Jesus and falling more in love with Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. And when I'm not like Jesus, it grieves my heart. It does. Doesn't it grieve your heart? Don't you say, Lord, I, have, I, I want to be more like you. Do your work in my heart. Whatever it takes, I really want to be more like you. And I've got a, a lot of rough edges you need to chip off. But, Lord, I'm yours. I'm the clay. You're the potter. Have at it. So love motivates like nothing else motivates. Love also is righteous. Love is righteous. Yes, it is. It is righteous. Notice uh, what Jesus says in Matthew 22. He says, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two rest all the law and the prophets. Now, the hippies and we preachers get real uncomfortable when I'm in this territory I'm in right now because people want to misunderstand it. The hippies like kind of had it right, let love reign, do what love says do. They kind of had it right, but they had it wrong because they didn't define love properly. We're talking about God kind of love, agape kind of love. Agape kind of love, remember, is a selfless, self-sacrificing, unconditional devotion to seeing God's highest good worked out in somebody else's life. Not the flesh's most base pleasures in somebody's life. Not their most self-serving ambitions in their lives. But true God love wants God's best for them. Period. When you want God's best, not your own best or what you think is, your, is God's best for somebody else, but when you genuinely want what is God's best for somebody else, then you're loving them and you can let love guide you and you'll be righteous. You'll be righteous. Because you'll be doing for them what God is wanting for them. Well, I'll let you chew on that one for a while. But love is righteous when it's agape love. By the way, what the hippies was, were doing was sort of eros and philos kind of love. It was not agape type of love. 
love is distinctive. And that's another reason it was listed first. Agape love is distinctive. Notice what Jesus says in John 13, 34. Would you read that with me, please? By this will, all men know that you are my true disciples if you have love one for another. Word true is in italics. I added that word because I wanted to give you the gist of what Jesus was saying there. Jesus was saying, if you're really my disciple, love is going to be the hallmark of your life. It doesn't mean you won't do tough things because love can be tough sometimes. Love can discipline. Love can reprove. That's why Proverbs says the wounds of a friend are faithful. But love is a character quality that is distinctive of the followers of Jesus. In other words, someone looking for a church family, seeing the love of Jesus in a church family, naturally say in their hearts, I want to be a part of that church family. I want to get in on that kind of love. A lost person who's from a dysfunctional home and a dysfunctional society, looking for love in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways, sees a genuine love between Randy King and me at the fitness center. We're just hobnobbing around, just kind of loving each other in the Lord. And they're saying, whatever you guys have, that's special. That's what I want. I haven't seen that anywhere in my experience. But whatever that is, that's what I want. A lost person, and they come to Randy, they come to me and they say, what is it that you guys have? It's just something special. And we get an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. But when a lost world sees the church, do they see bickering? Do they see factions? Do they see love? That's a God type of love. Where the body of believers are self-sacrificingly, unconditionally committed to seeing God's perfect will worked out in each other's lives. That's a wonderful thing. Folks, I've got a ways to go. You've got a way to go. Therefore, our church is still in process, a work in process. Would you agree with me on that? We have further that we can go in this, and God bless us and lead us in that regard. All right? So love is distinctive. If you love Jesus, you've got to love one another. Now, I'd like to look at 1 Corinthians 13 in the few minutes that we have remaining. I, I, I kind of would love to have read through this passage and identified each one of these character qualities, but I'm going to give them to you and encourage you to maybe spend some time in 1 Corinthians 13 this week in your quiet time. I'm going to give you uh, several qualities of, of agape love. And 1 Corinthians says love does not do this, love does that. I'm going to put them all in a positive uh, reference, okay? But you've got to ask yourself, is this the kind of love that I display in my life toward my spouse, toward my children, toward my fellow believers, toward my work associates, whether they're Christians or non-Christians? Is this the kind of love that the Holy Spirit is producing in my life, or do I have a lot of work for the Holy Spirit to do? Number one, Paul says agape, Holy Spirit kind of love, is patient. It is patient. Second, Holy Spirit type of love is kind. It is kind. Uh, folks, maybe you, House is your favorite TV program. But I can't watch that guy. He wears me out. That is one of the most insensitive, unkind human beings I've ever seen in my life. He could be just as good a doctor and not be so patently unkind to people. It's like he has no feelings at all. I mean, if you haven't watched him, watch him. You'll see exactly what I mean. But Holy Spirit type of love is kind. A little human kindness, a little divine kindness, I should have said. Third, according to 1 Corinthians 13, Holy Spirit type of love rejoices with God's blessings in the lives of others. It's not covetous. It doesn't see God's blessings in a fellow believer's life and start getting jealous and covetous and say, why didn't you bless me like that, God? It genuinely rejoices 
in God's blessings in their lives, genuinely, whether they deserve those blessings or not in your estimation. Next, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit type of love is humble. It is humble. It prefers others to itself. It gives others more honor than it gives itself. Next, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us that Holy Spirit type of love is considerate. It is considerate of how other people feel, how other people will react. It does take into consideration. It is empathetic. It does consider other people and their feelings. Uh, if somebody is selfish and self-centered and always determined they're going to do what is in their best interest or what they want to do and they're insensitive to those around them, that's not Holy Spirit type of love. Because Holy Spirit type of love is not me-centered, it's other-oriented. Remember, self-sacrificing, unconditional commitment to others, God's will in their lives. Also, a uh, Holy Spirit type of love seeks God's will. That's why we put it in the, the uh, definition, seeking God's highest good for their lives. It seeks God's will. That's what keeps it righteous and holy. That's what keeps it rejoicing in truth and in godliness. Also, a Holy Spirit type of love chooses to believe the best. Um, if you hear a nasty little juicy rumor about Tom Fortner, your first reaction should be, I don't believe that. That's not the Tom Fortner that I know. Now, where did you get that information? We're going to track it back and find out where that bit of information came from. I don't believe it. I choose not. Well, you're just naive. No, I'm choosing to believe the best about my brother Tom. So let's trace this back. Let's find out whether this is true or not. And I will choose to believe the best about Tom until I actually have irrefutable evidence that the information is accurate. Then I might need to go to Tom and rebuke him, reprove him, love on him some. Okay? But love chooses to believe the best. It's a choice. Rather than, oh, really? That, that's true about Tom? Did you hear about Tom Fortner? That's not love. It's not, a, it's not a Holy Spirit type of love. Holy Spirit type of love rejoices in godliness. It loves to see people prospering in the Lord. It is grieved by ungodliness. Holy Spirit type of love is honest. It's honest, but it tells the truth in love. You know the truth can be devastating. Or you can say the truth in love. And it can be edifying. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only what is good for edification, Paul says. And then finally, Holy Spirit type of love endures all trials. It's like the ever-ready bunny. It just keeps on going. Uh, when human love is given up, thrown in the towel, Holy Spirit type of love keeps on loving with an unconditional self-sacrificing type of love. Now, aren't you glad that God loves you in this fashion. Amen. I am so glad that He loves me in this fashion. And He wants, if I will let Christ sit on the throne of my heart and fill me with the Holy Spirit, He wants to produce these character traits of Jesus right there in my life. And if these are not true in my life, the Lord Jesus and I need to get together and we need to do some business. Because I'm sitting on the throne. I'm not letting Jesus rule and fill me with His Spirit. Now, all of this is not going to happen at once. But it will start happening as we walk in the Spirit.